when the Mormon pioneers came to the Great Basin, each one brought with him his own personal talents and ambition, his own sense of purpose. Each one worked with his own hands and saw through his own eyes. William Clayton wrote of what he saw in his first view of the valley on Thursday, July 22nd, 1847. For my own part, I am happily disappointed in the appearance of the Valley of the Salt Lake. But if the land be as rich as it has the appearance of being, I have no fears. But the saints can live here and do well while we do right. Harriet Young reacted somewhat differently. Weak and weary as I am, I would rather go a thousand miles farther than remain in such a forsaken place as this. But she stayed. She stayed to work with her own hands and worship after the feelings of her heart. She stayed with the others and did her share. July 24th, the day Brigham Young and his party entered the valley was a Saturday. There was much work to be done, exploring, plowing, planting, building. Worship was important to the pioneer saints. July 25th was the Sabbath day and they kept it holy. The settlers gathered for sacrament services and religious instructions. The seven apostles who had come in the party all spoke. Orson Pratt chose for his text, Isaiah. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Brigham Young was too ill that day to preach a sermon, but he spoke briefly about the importance of keeping the Sabbath day holy. There was to be no work, no hunting, no fishing. The saints would lose five times as much as they would gain if they worked on the Lord's day. July 26, 1847, two days after he arrived in the valley, Brigham Young and some of the apostles explored the immediate area. They journeyed north, where they climbed a peak which they named Ensign Peak. It was to symbolize the gathering of the righteous to serve the Lord. Isaiah had prophesied, And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far, and behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. On Wednesday, July 28th, Brigham Young indicated with his cane the site for the new temple. Two weeks later, in an attitude of renewal and rededication, Brigham Young and the other apostles were rebaptized. They were followed by 260 other members. This was a symbol of the beginning of their new life in their western home, a reaffirmation of their faith and devotion. There was more to do than pray and sermonize. There was an entire valley to cultivate. The saints put their hands to the plow. At the end of the first week, about 53 acres had been plowed and planted. There was much to be done to prepare for the future and the coming winter. No man could do it alone. So under the direction of inspired leadership, they worked together, each one taking his part. Each man acquired what some were pleased to call a precious stewardship. Brigham told them, There will be no buying or selling of land. Every man is to have his land measured out to him, both for city and for farming purposes. He can till it as he pleases, but he must be industrious and take care of it. During the fall and winter, they built nearly 12 miles of fence in one long, continuous length. They enclosed 5,000 acres with timber brought down laboriously from the mountains. The entire area was called the Big Farm. Each family could sign up for as many acres of the big farm as they could properly care for. Some took 40 acres, some 20, and some less. Water and timber were other precious stewardships held in common. Each man obtained a share in them through the labor of his own hands. Simultaneously with the planting, irrigating, and fencing of crops, there was still the urgent matter of shelter to be provided against the approaching winter. This work began early. Beginning at the southeast corner of the temple block 
Orson Pratt surveyed the surrounding area and the new city was marked off in 10 acre blocks. The blocks were divided into city lots. The cost of a city lot was $1.50. $1 for the surveying cost and 50 cents for the recording cost. The city was called the City of the Salt Lake, Great Basin, North America. One block of it became known as the Old Fort. Elder John Taylor described the fort. Our houses were built on the outside line of the fort in shanty form, with the highest wall outside, the roof sloping towards the interior. The windows and doors were placed on the side, facing the enclosure, the outside being left solid, excepting loopholes for protection. Our corrals, haystacks, and stables were some distance behind and outside the fort. Mary Isabella Horn was more vivid in her description. Our house being covered only with poles, grass, and earth, it continued to rain in the house after it was fine outside. Wagon covers were fastened nearly to the roof over the head of the bed, sloping to the foot to shed the water and keep the bed dry. A large piece of oil cloth was tacked up over the table while we ate our meals, and it was no uncommon thing to see a woman holding an umbrella over herself while attending to her household duties. One of the greatest sources of trouble and inconvenience were the mice. The ground was full of them. They ran over us in our beds, ate into our boxes, and destroyed much valuable clothing. Various kinds of mouse traps were devised, but relief was obtained only after securing a kitten from the only family of cats in the camp. Out of the 2,000 saints who entered the valley that fall, 1,600 of them wintered there. The others, among them President Young, returned to the body of the saints at winter quarters. Uncle John Smith, president of the stake, was left in charge. For the children, there were school lessons. Intellectual pursuits can distract the thoughts from the grimness of reality, and there was much to relieve the day-to-day -day drudgery, the recurring Sabbaths, dancing, picnics, and holiday celebrations. Music and dancing can cheer the heart and add pleasantness to life. As winter approached, the saints needed all the cheer their hearts could get. In October, the mountain trails were closed by the snow, leaving the saints isolated from help and preventing them from returning east. However, unusually mild weather prevailed in the valley. There was plowing, planting of winter wheat, building and hunting long into the winter. The harvest of summer crops was meager. Much of it must be saved for seed. It was not long before they realized they had not brought enough food with them. Jesse N. Smith tells of his experience that winter. He was 13. I was just at an age when my appetite was very keen, but there was no help for it. We voluntarily put ourselves upon rations. We had about half a pound of flour per day for each person without any vegetables, and but little meat, sometimes none. But we had a little milk from one cow. I was exceedingly hungry. For months, my desire for food was not satisfied. Eliza R. Snow's diary from October to May is mainly concerned with food and where it came from. She carefully records exact amounts and who it was that shared with her out of their own meager stores. October 17th. I feel greatly blessed, both temporally and spiritually. Mrs. Young brought me more than one pound of sugar and Mrs. Pierce a few dozen crackers, for which I praise the Lord. John Lyman Smith assessed the meat that was available. We killed some of our fattest cattle to help along, and they were so poor that they were unsaleable, except upon compulsion. They were thin and tough indeed. There was not even enough fat on them to render lard for soap. By February, many were near starvation. Hunger drove them to the hills in search of the native vegetables. Following the custom of the Indians, they found thistle greens, and their boiled roots were good for food. The bulb of the sago lily became a staple. That which happened to one person affected the entire community. In February, one of the children died, probably from eating poisonous vegetables. Eliza R. Snow wrote, 
The angel of death with a sudden blow in the season of youth has laid him low. In a time when the heart's warm springs were ripe with the hopes and the prospects of future life. Spring did come, and with it mounting hopes. The winter wheat began to show green in the fields. And in April, some men returned from California with a hundred cows, some potatoes, and a few bushels of wheat. John Lyman Smith wrote about it later. My father got eight small potatoes from which he raised one bushel, which we took great care of for seed. On April 16th, John Steele wrote, Green stuff is coming up very fast. Wheat and corn and beans and peas are all up and looking grand. The grass is six inches high. Now all hands were busy with the spring work, planting, irrigating, fencing, becoming accustomed to farming in the new environment. On May 27th, Harriet Young wrote in her husband Lorenzo's diary. We have grappled with the frost. But today, to our astonishment, the crickets came by millions, sweeping everything before them. We went out with brush and undertook to drive them, but they were too strong for us. Night brought new frosts, morning, new crickets. The next day, May 28th, Eliza R. Snow wrote, This morning's frost, in unison with the ravages of the crickets for a few days past, produces many sighs and occasionally some long faces. It seemed impossible to drown them. We endeavored to make head against this new enemy armed with sticks and clubs. All the people near us, male and female, turned out. It was wearisome work contending against such fearful odds. The work was not merely wearisome. It was discouraging. The saints began to think of fleeing the valley. The cry is now raised, we cannot live here. Away to California. The faith of many is shaken. John Young, a counselor in the presiding High Council, urged that an express be sent to warn Brigham Young not to send any more saints to the valley. They would all starve to death. Other leaders were determined to stay. When John Neff quit building on his grain mill, expecting there would be no grain to grind, stake president John Smith assured him there would be grain and offered to secure him against any loss he might suffer by finishing his building. Brother Neff finished his mill. Native gulls from the nearby Great Salt Lake finally brought hope after weeks of suffering. John Lyman Smith wrote of the event in his personal history. Early one morning as I passed the corner of our cabins, I heard a sound as of a furious wind. I was walking slowly with bowed head and raising my eyes saw the sky filled with white birds which came from the west and settled upon our fields covering the ground apparently for miles. I turned to the house and grasped my gun when someone said, the birds are taking what's left. I crept near the rows of corn to watch their movements. They were so much engaged that they scarcely noticed me. I approached within a few feet and saw they touched no green thing. It seemed intent on trying which could gorge the greatest number of crickets going over the ground two or three times. The seagulls disgorged the indigestible portions and continued eating the crickets. The gulls came every morning for about three weeks. Can it be wondered that we looked with affection upon our deliverers? It seems the hand of the Lord is in our favor. The harvest was barely adequate and the saints stored seed and prepared foodstuffs for the winter ahead. Now it was time to look to future settlements. Brigham Young returned from the east and directed groups of saints to spread out to the north and south to form other colonies. Already, Peregrine Sessions and Samuel Brown had gone north to Bountiful, seeking fresh range for their cattle. James Brown and his sons, with others from the Mormon battalion, had bought a ranch from Miles Goodyear, a fur trapper, on the Weber River farther north. 
Others of the most energetic and talented men were chosen to establish new colonies still farther afield. Brigham Young supervised it all. He envisioned a vast Mormon corridor, a line of settlements from north of Salt Lake City to south of a California seaport. This vast Mormon empire would draw strength from the missionary effort and the saints' own vigor. Here, God's children could gather to enjoy the blessings of his kingdom. Here, they would worship their God, build the temple, stand as an ensign to all the world for the gathering of all nations. Here would the prophecy be fulfilled as spoken by Isaiah. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. <laughs> 